Welcome everyone here to a, another episode of the DL. I am your host, Tyler Robertson, and this show is gonna be a little bit different uh, because it's all about me. <laughs> it's actually about diesel laptops. So I get asked a lot, like the story behind diesel laptops, where did I come from? How did we get started? Uh, more importantly, I, I was just asked to do a presentation on how did I grow diesel laptops? And they wanted me to do a speech in front of an audience for 45 minutes. And I was like, sure, I'll do it. And then I, I started thinking about it and I was like, wait, how the heck did I do that? Like, what, what do we actually do? How did that, how do we accomplish that? So um, this is, uh, I think gonna be a little bit interesting. I think there's probably some stories in here. Actually, I know there's some stories in here that, that I haven't shared before. And if you're on the audio only portion, um, I will do my best to talk about the slides. But if you're in the video portion, you're obviously gonna see a bunch of uh, graphics and slides come up here through the whole conversation. Um, so let's just start with me. All right. So first of all, um, I've been around commercial trucks, and you're gonna you're gonna see this here in a little bit for for over 20 years. Uh, I'm the founder and CEO of Diesel Laptops, like I started every episode with. I've been doing this thing full time here for about eight years now. Um, so I put up here again for the video portion here. This is this is our Diesel Laptop headquarters here in Emerald, South Carolina. We've been around since 2013. Um, that's really when I started doing it. And, and really I started it for one reason only. That was to make some beer money on the side. I was working for somebody else. I just wanted to make a little bit, a little bit of extra money. Uh, but today we have over 200 employees. We've been uh, a winner of the Inc. 5000 over five times, uh, five times, maybe six times now. And we actually were the Inc. 500 uh, one of those years as well, which means you're, you know, top 500 fastest growing companies, privately held companies in the United States, which I, which I think is a feat. Um, we've been the second fastest growing company in South Carolina a couple times. I've actually uh, never been first. I've always had someone else always snuck up on us in the rankings there. Uh, but we've also won the South Carolina Small Business Association Exporter of the Year Award a couple years back. And the way we grew this thing isn't, isn't the new way where people go raise money and they, they go build the thing really fast. I bootstrapped it. Um, and a lot of that's probably just because I didn't know any different or I, I really didn't need to. I was just so focused on keeping one foot in front of the other. Um, so we, we cash flow the company and we're going to talk about debt here a little bit as well. Um, so again, up on, the, up on the table, up on the slides, you'll see like we're, we're pretty transparent on, on who we are and our revenue. I, I talk a lot about it, especially on LinkedIn. So, you know, 2015, we did about $3.5 million in sales. And this year we got our eyes set on 100 million. I don't, I don't know if we're going to get there. It's going to be, it's going to be really, really close um, if we don't make it. But I think we got, a, we got a legit shot at getting there. And I've been, I've been really fortunate seeing the picture in the upper left there of my garage. That's, that's really where it started. I just had a couple shelves in there, slinging some product. Didn't really have any idea or plan where this thing would go. And now we do have a 37,000 square foot headquarters here in Irmo, South Carolina. And we'll talk about training centers. We actually own or rent other property across the country where we do training centers. We just opened a beautiful new place in Columbia, South Carolina, uh, which is right, out, right, right near us here. Uh, well over seven, fi seven, seven figures into that guy uh, to make a diesel technician training center um, and move our training division over there. And we'll, we'll talk about why we do diesel technician training as well and what that means. Um, but I, I think my, my story is a little unique in the fact that zero of this was planned for. I, I never... I never set out to go create diesel laptops or even be in this industry. Uh, my, my dad, he and his brothers, they own commercial trucks. They own gravel pit operations. I was around them forever um, in the ready mix business, but I knew, I knew I didn't want to do that my whole life. I was really into computers and you gotta think late nineties, lot, not a lot of technology or computers are going into making concrete every day. Uh, so there's a picture of me in the year 2000. That's me at RIT. I'm out in Rochester, New York. Actually, it was even earlier than that. It's probably like 98, 99. Um, so I went to school to be a computer engineer. And that's my dad in the upper right picture. And my dad, um, you know, I didn't know it at the time, but I, I knew it after. He had to get a, you know, it was a really expensive school. I, probably one of, the, one of the most nerdiest schools you can find for computer engineering and computer science. And uh, I think it was like $60,000 a year at that time is what it cost. My dad went and got a second mortgage on his house to, to be able to afford to put me to college. And uh, I can tell the audience listening to this, there, there's two great things I learned at college. 
Uh, one, you don't go to class, you get kicked out because you get bad grades. So I learned, I learned that lesson uh, my second year of school, essentially, uh, when I, I promptly got the boot from the school uh, not being there. And there was a second reason as well, and I'll kind of just kind of leave it at this. It's amazing how much trouble you can get into behind a keyboard and on the internet. So probably doing things I, I actually, doing things I definitely shouldn't have been doing on the internet. Uh, but hey, it was, I was a computer engineer. It was a school full of my peers. We did things we, we probably shouldn't have been doing on the internet. Um, and I kind of paid the price for that. But what happened here was, is at the time, I'm, you know, 20, 21, getting kicked out of college, kind of that first like gut punch I've ever had in my life. Uh, I thought it was the worst thing that happened to me, but it ended up being one of the best because I had to go home, tail tucked between my legs. And my dad, God bless him, is like, hey, no problem. You can come back home and uh, you can come work for me because we started a truck dealership. And I got some screenshots or some pictures up there, some articles uh, from, from way back in the day of my family starting this truck dealership. And there was a failed Western Star truck franchise in Northern Minnesota. My family bought it, or the rights to it at least. And then they went and worked with, um, with Western Star to expand out two locations up in Northern Minnesota. Um, and then we ended up buying the Freightliner dealership and put them all under one roof. But the, the way I like to describe a truck dealership for people that have never been inside a truck dealership or ran a truck dealership. Um, and I've had, I've had some guys on here with like key advisors and some other guys. Uh, they'll tell you there, there are a hundred ways to lose money making a truck dealership. And there's about one way to make money. And I, I'm, I guarantee you our family found at least 101 different ways to lose money running a truck dealership. It was, it was I'm going to say, kind of a real shit show at times. We didn't know what we were doing, getting bad advice, some bad hires. But we, we learned a lot of lessons. Um, but I went to go work for the, for the new employer once my family sold it. I had the choice to go. They sold it to, to a big Sterling dealership group. Um, who's, who's actually no longer in business. I got bought by someone else now. But they put all three brands under one roof. And uh, I loved that business. Like I had worked in parts, I'd worked in service and accounting and sales. I was general manager. Like I, I loved, loved, loved the commercial truck dealership world. And I had an option to, to stay with that new employer or I had the option to work for my dad. So I was like, man, I love this business. I'm gonna go work for somebody else. And kind of that's where life, life, uh, life number two happened um, at me here too. And I got fired. Um, I, I, the first time I ever worked for somebody else that wasn't my dad, I got fired. And deservedly so, um, in hindsight. Um, and there was a lot of other reasons. But again, you know, if you've ever been fired from a job and have to go home and tell your wife or if you have kids or significant other, like, oh, hey, by the way, I'm home early. I got fired today. It, it's, never, it's never a fun, pleasant conversation to have. Um, but again, it ended up being one of the best things that ever happened to me in hindsight because what I did is I put my resume together and I, I started going on the internet. This is the days of like monster.com was popular and I don't even know what else we were using back then. Hot jobs probably. Uh, but what happened is, is a headhunter found me. And I didn't know at the time, but it, dealerships are looking for talent. Every commercial truck dealership group out there is looking for talented people that understand the space because there's not a lot of them. Uh, and I was really fortunate to uh, get connected with that headhunter. He ended up traveling me around to New Jersey, uh, New Jersey, New York area, uh, out in Billings, Montana and South Carolina. And I ended up getting multiple job offers. And I took the one here in South Carolina to become a service manager over a pretty big truck dealership group. It was Carolina International Trucks right up the road from me now today in South Carolina up in Greer. Um, and again, I, I love that industry. I love the people that I met there. And that was really kind of where I learned how a truck dealership really should operate because this was a profitable truck dealership that had been around for a lot of years. They had their, their learning years back in the day but they had really figured things out. There was a ton of opportunity for me there. A lot of people that were retiring soon. And I had a challenge that the dealership I, I went to there, they had a service department that was in complete disarray. And I had the chance to go in there and, and help fix it. So I, uh, I was doing a great job being a service manager for a couple of years. And then they asked me to be the parts manager and, or to actually be the general manager. 
But they said, before you be the general manager, we want you to work in the parts department. So you understand that side of the house. And that is when I, uh, I went to work for the parts department. And now 2008 hits. And if anyone was around listening to this in 2008, you, you kind of already know what happened. Banks cut credit lines, economy tumbled, um, things didn't go good at all. Nobody was buying new trucks in 2008. Um, and the markets, the markets went, went really, really poorly. And the store manager, the general manager I was supposed to replace, uh, said, Tyler, I'm sorry, I can't retire now because I've lost a, a third of everything I own. <laughs> it was all in the stock market. <laughs> and I'm like, great. Now I'm sitting here, I am a parts manager, and I want, I want nothing, that, this is not my life goal to be a parts manager. And now I don't know what my future holds for me. Um, so I was, I was, I saw an opportunity though. The, the marketing manager quit, the IT manager retired. So I called the owner up and said, Hey, I'll, I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll save you a, a salary here. Like, I, I know you think I'm a great parts manager and service manager and know this, but I, I promise you, I know IT and marketing way better than I ever do this commercial truck world. Give me a chance. I'll come down there and I will, I will show you guys what I can do. So they were, I was luckily to be convinced of them, but through this whole process, is is where the the seed of diesel laptops really got founded and what happened was is i started to learn that people needed help and where i saw that was in the service department first when i was service manager um, when you run a truck dealership you want one two three four weeks of backlog trucks in your yard because what that means to you as a service manager is all your technicians are happy they're usually flat rates they're going to make great money and I'm gonna make great numbers this month. My whole month's booked up. Like I don't have to worry about finding work. I'm gonna hit my bonus number. That's, that's really what everything was incentivized around. Now, if you're the customer, that absolutely sucks to go roll into a dealership and say, hey, you gotta wait three weeks till I can work on your thing. And I'm, I'm probably more customer centric than a lot of people. So um, I told our guys like, look, we're not gonna do this. We're gonna take care of our customers better. I do like the backlog, but we can, we can load this thing a different way. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna go triage trucks as they roll into the shop, as they come in. So when a truck comes in, don't tell them three weeks, say like, I'll tell you what, let me go out there and look at it real quick or go look at the fault codes or let's go out there and do a quick triage and let's make a decision if you need to really leave this or can you like keep running it around for a week or two until we can work you into the schedule. Well, you do that for customers a couple times, right? Hook the laptop up, show them the codes, go, oh, you gotta leave it. Nope, take it, see you next week. They inevitably start asking you, well, how do I buy that tool? I want to, I don't want to have to come to you. I can do that. Right. And when I worked in the dealership side on the service side, that was not an option. We didn't, we didn't allow customers to buy the diagnostic tools our shop used, right? We're a dealership. This is why you come to us. You have to pay us money. This is our knowledge. This is part of what we get, um, which I, I totally believed at the time. Um, however, when I, they moved me to the parts department side of the house, um, different, same building, same rooftop, but now I report to a different person. And he really didn't care that I would sell diagnostic software because he had his numbers to meet. He wanted to sell as much as possible. Um, it didn't matter that we were selling diagnostic tools, brake drums, uh, or a cheeseburger. He didn't, he didn't really care as long as we were making some margin and taking care of our customers. So that's really where the first uh, idea came with me was selling software to customers in the parts department. But what I, what I quickly found out was customers that were buying software are 50, 60 year old shop owners. They don't, they don't know what to do. They don't know how to install software, how to license it, how to configure uh, Bluetooth, how to update firmware. These are all foreign concepts to, to somebody in a shop. And remember this is the early 2000s, right? This isn't, this isn't 2023. So people were confused. And the, what happened is they were selling software and then I was installing it. I was supporting it because I was the parts manager slash service manager. I knew how to do it. I was taking care of the customers, but it became a time suck. So I had, to, I had a bright idea. I, I called my boss up and I go, hey, how about um, I buy the software license from you. I buy the interface device, which is the thing that goes between the laptop and the truck. I'll buy that from you. I'm gonna buy a laptop on my own off eBay, like a rugged one. And I'm gonna install all the software and I'll sell you back a kit ready to go. And you can just mark it up and sell it to the customer. And that makes a, a better sellable product with more value. You make more margin. Plus you're making the margin off of me buying your stuff. And I don't have to do anything anymore. I don't have to deal with installing and licensing. And he said, great, let's go do that. Um, and that's really, I think, kind of planned the seed 
for what I already know and people already know is people don't want products, they want solutions to the problem that they have, especially in the B2B world. Um, and it even, it even makes sense a lot in the B2C world as well. Um, but that's where, that's where the idea got started to putting together kits to sell to customers. And my first customer was actually my employer. So it was a, a really unique relationship at the time and, and things were going along really, really well. Um, we're selling more and more kits. Um, I started actually putting them on eBay and uh, the agreement I had was I would never sell them in South Carolina uh, with my employer. So I was shipping them everywhere else. And the problem got to be uh, one day I'm, I'm sitting there and the person I report to, the owner's daughter, she comes to me and says, hey, Tyler, great news. Uh, we're going to give you a 10% raise and we're going to double your bonus this year. And I'm like, oh, that's great. But I feel like there's a catch because I just got my bonus and I just got my raise. So what's going on? And she says, well, the catch is, is you need to quit your side business. It needs to go away. And I'm like, okay, well, you, I mean, obviously my job performance must be all right. You're giving me a raise. Like what's, I'm not understanding what's going on here. And she's like, well, you're taking business away from dealerships. And I'm like, okay, um, I, I, I'm not in South Carolina. That's where we are. She's like, I know, but it's not fair to our other dealership friends. And I'm like, okay, but the, the problem here is if it's not me, it's somebody else. And if, if you think removing what I'm doing from the equation is gonna give more business to them, they probably have a bigger problem. They probably need to figure out, take better care of their customers or figure out another solution because being the only one that can do something isn't, isn't like a really sustainable business model with the way the world works. Um, she's like, well, it's either take the offer or be fired or you need to resign. I'm like, great. Um, so I, I, at this point, just to keep my, my, my daily life at this point was working from like 5.30 in the morning till like midnight every night between the two jobs, uh, my employer and my side business. But I have a one-year-old, I have a three-year-old, I have a wife that stays at home with them to take care of them. I have my 401k, I got my health insurance, and I get a paycheck every other week from the, my current position. And I have this fledging eBay whatever business with my biggest customer, majority of my revenue, uh, being my own employer who's about to fire me. So I'm like, how's this gonna work? And and I, I did what I think, and my dad hates this story by the way, so if he's listening to that, I'm, I'm sorry. He'll, he'll twist this and say it's a different way. But uh, what happened is I called my dad and told him the situation, and he's like, yeah, you need to like, quit that side business, sell it to them, find another, go hire employees to get the side business going, but don't tell them, like fig figure out, a, like you just, you need to keep that job. And I'm like, that's actually very sound advice, dad. If I had kids now, I do, uh, I would probably give them the same advice, right? It's, it's risky to go, to go do something like that, especially the situation I was in and I'd been there 10 years and they love me and I love the job. Um, and then I, I went home and I, I remember talking to, to my wife and she just said, well, what's the worst case if you, if you quit your job and, um, and do this full time? I'm like, like what, how, how much cash do we have? What can we do? I'm like, well, we have no debt. And we'll, we'll talk about why, why I run debt free as well here in a second. And she also said, what's the worst case? And I go, well, I guess it doesn't work. I just go find another job somewhere. She's like, well, we have no family here in South Carolina. No big deal. It doesn't work out. Just quit your job and find another one. Maybe we can move back home. I'm like, all right. So I, I quit my job to, to do this thing at Diesel Laptops. Um, and sometimes I think what, what people need to realize is that there's, there's always some things that get thrown at you in life that turn out to be not great moments or you think them at the time. But in hindsight, when you look back on it, they made you a better person. They, made, they forced you to make a decision. Something happened to, to create that. And in this case, all three times, getting kicked out of college, getting fired, and really giving an ultimatum um, about my future and to being the best three things that ever happened to me. And it allowed me to go create uh, diesel laptops. So if you're on the video portion, you'll see a picture on the left. I actually had to go to like the waybackmachine.com to go find like, go, go show, you know, waybackmachine.com. You can go see original images from your website like years ago. So that is my original website. Literally an automotive dude holding, holding uh, an automotive part and probably the junkiest website you've ever seen in your life. But that was that was Diesel Laptops when I first started. And I didn't have a logo. Um, I had to go, I went on I went on uh, Odesk, which is now uh, upworks.com, and paid tw someone 25 bucks to make me a logo um, because I, I feel like I needed to legitimize a little bit. Uh, but I had about 40, 40 different products. I had the kit, I had my core kit, and I had a bunch of little add-ons and cables and adapters and, and things. But 
But what it did is it led me to say, I need to go focus now 100% on this thing. And I can tell you, it was scary day one. <laughs> I remember I remember waking up, uh, working all morning, having lunch uh, with the family and being asked at the dinner table, you know, lunch table, how much you sell today so far? <laughs> like uh, zero dollars. I have sold zero dollars today so far. But thank you for putting the extra pressure on me. You know, five hours into this this new adventure we're doing. Uh, but it ended up it ended up working out pretty well, obviously. But the reality was is I am I am one man at my dining room table and garage with a crappy website, and I'm now competing against brand names we all recognize: Snap On, Bosch. Noragon. I mean, these, some of these guys are billion-dollar publicly traded companies, right? Um, they have billions of revenue. I, I literally, I think my annual revenue at that point would be like a rounding error for some of these divisions of the company. Uh, they got thousands of employees. They have existing distribution channels. Snap-on has thousands of mobile trucks running around selling diagnostic tools. Bosch has distribution into every single commercial truck retailer across the country. Uh, Noragon has been around for 20 years and has distributors set up and selling direct and enterprise people. I got, I got me and nobody even knows who the hell I am, right? I have, the, I, have, I have nothing, no social media following. No one's even heard the word diesel laptops before. No one's even seen the logo. Um, and I'm in my garage, right? These guys got multiple locations all over the place. So the, the question always is, how do you do it? How, how, did, how did we grow it from, from that moment to where we're at today, which today we're the biggest diagnostic tool seller in North America. Uh, so how did, how did we do that? And really, when I had to sit back and think about it, it, it really came down to like four, four core points. And I actually just had a one-on-one -on -one meeting with someone today asking for advice on how to do this. So they were just getting started out. And it was the exact same thing I'm going to story I'm going to tell you here. I, I, I look back at it now and I think we did four things really, really well um, that, that all those big companies could not do. And no matter how big the competitor is, how long they've been around for, I guarantee you there's things they're not doing that their customers are asking for. So number one, I knew, hey, I need to position myself as knowledgeable and trustworthy. I need to be shown, I need people to know I am the expert. I, I've worked in dealerships for, for over a decade. I worked in the service department, I worked in the parts department. I know how these things work. I know how to fix trucks and I know what the problems are. I just need the world to know that, that I do know that stuff and I can be trusted and I can lead them down the right path. Uh, the other one was I need to own the internet. And we're going to talk about that in a second. But based on owning the internet, what I want to talk about there is making sure that no matter where people were on the internet, no matter what they were looking for, diesel laptops was going to come up first and foremost. And we'll talk about that. The other one is, is we've had maybe to the extreme end, the, the whole idea to provide more value of our diagnostic tools than anybody else. So I knew if I just packed in more and more value that customers would buy from me. And the other one is really because I was running debt free, I didn't have, I didn't have banks helping me. All I had was myself and my cash flow. I had to make sure every single dollar really, really mattered. And you see this a lot of time in companies that go raise a lot of money, they go crazy. Hey, I raise a bunch of money. I'm gonna go hire a bunch of people or do a bunch of things. And nope, oh, now I'm broke. I gotta go raise more money again. And I was, I was like, I, I, again, scorched earth in my personal life. We got rid of everything. We we're down to bare bones. I was like, same thing in the company. Every single dollar matters here. I got a, I got a one-year-old and a three-year-old. I got to put a roof over their head. They got college coming up someday. I got to figure this out. So it really forced me to make smart decisions. So let's go talk about the first one, right? How do you, how do you become trustworthy, right? So the saying is people buy from the people they trust. And we all, we all know this. Nobody wants to be sold something, especially in the B2B world, even in, even in the car world, right? We wanna buy from people we can trust that will be good advice, they'll lead us down the right path, right? I don't wanna go buy a home and tell the person I'm looking for a $200,000 home that's 2,000 square feet and they're showing me 500 square foot homes or 10,000 square foot homes saying, yeah, yeah, but you can afford it. Like, I, I don't want that. I want someone I can trust. I want someone I can walk into a house is a real estate with an agent and they'd be like, you don't want this house. And here's the reasons why. Like that, that's the kind of person I wanted to be at Diesel Laptops. I wanted customers to call us and be like, hey, I have a problem. I need something. What do I, how can you help me? What do I need to buy? And I knew I had to become the authority. I knew I had the knowledge. I just needed the world to know, hey, we are here to help you solve your problem. That is our reason for being here. So the first thing I did was YouTube. I was like, all right, 
I am gonna go create a bunch of videos showing the, what the products we have do and the problems they solve. And I can tell people today that um, I, have a, I have a screenshot up here of one of our original videos from 2015. But if you can picture me outside at a uh, truck repair facilities lot with probably cars and engines honking and everything going on, that I'm sitting there with one hand on the laptop, the other hand holding a cell phone, and I'm literally just walking people through uh, how the tool works. Um, some of those videos are still some of our highest performing videos today. Uh, though some of those videos, uh, 25, 30, 40,000 views. And I know these aren't you know, Mr. Beast type numbers if you're on YouTube, uh, whoever you follow on there, but you gotta remember, we're in the B2B space in a very, very micro niche thing, right? Like this is really, really small, what we're trying to do. So to have someone watch your videos 25,000 times, uh, one video on how hooking up to a 2007 Freightliner with a Detroit diesel engine, People are paying attention. Uh, people are going there. And I can tell people today, our YouTube channel is coming up on 9 million views. So to sit here and say, wow, we got 9 million views. I think we're approaching like 20,000 subscribers. I'm proud of those numbers. Yeah, they're not huge from what you see on mainstream, but in our space, that that is more views and more subscribers than anybody else. Probably, it's probably more than most of our other competitors combined uh, in our space. And it really goes back to people go on the internet not to listen to sales pitches. They go on there to learn something or to be entertained or to solve whatever problem they got, whether it's boredom or an actual problem, they are there. That is what they're trying to do. So YouTube was the first great one that we, we did. And the other one is blogs. So for people that don't know blogs, I'm gonna tell you the secret here with blogs. Uh, blogs are just meant to get you traffic, right? That is the, what you wanna do, but how do you do that? You create and write blogs that are relevant, that show information, and you optimize them for the right keywords. So for example, we have a blog called The Cold Hard Truth on Trucking Mission Deletes and Tunes. I can tell you there is nothing in there that is positive about doing a delete and a tune. Um, because people call deleting tuning now or weight loss, there's a whole bunch of words people use, but they're all deletes, they're all illegal. Uh, that one blog post, I probably spent eight hours putting that together, which some people would say that was a huge waste of time to spend a full day putting together a blog post. I would say, well, that blog's brought us over 2,000 unique visitors to our website. I would say that was probably one of the best uses of my time that year, writing that blog post. And as I was scaling the company here, we were, I was pretty, I was pretty careful about making sure we were writing good content that was relevant. Um, so the chart at the bottom, you can see back in 2017, we were getting something like you know, 20,000, 30,000 page views. Um, really got to go back even further uh, a, a month. Now we do, you know, now we're approaching 300,000 page views a month with our platform. And if you, again, on the video portion, that, that bar chart does what all charts you want to see that talk about income or traffic, they go up and to the right. Um, as long as things are going up and to the right, life is good. Uh, but obviously our website's got a lot better uh, through that. The other, the other big piece of it when it comes to content creation was social media. So some people say YouTube social media, it can be. But for me, I, I didn't have a lot of people to talk to. I, I didn't have a mentor. I didn't have people I could talk about business things with. I'm in my garage, my dining room. I don't, I don't know anybody. I don't know anybody in this market. I was a service manager and art parts manager and IT marketing guy. Like I didn't have accountants and CPAs and CEOs and executives to go lean up against. Um, so LinkedIn became my, my way just to be like, this is what's going on in my life. And when I look back on it now, um, I think one of the things I've done or tried to do is be very transparent to people and to put out content that people care about. So I tell people, if you want to do LinkedIn, first of all, it's one of the best networking tools I've ever done. Second of all, there's three things you never talk about on LinkedIn. Uh, you don't talk about politics, you don't talk about religion, and you don't talk about your products and services. Uh, as ironic as that is, nobody cares about the posts I do and the updates or this thing or that thing. Nobody cares. They get very little traction. Uh, but I've got three posts up there to show you that my three most popular ones over the last 12 months. Uh, one of them is literally me on my dock, sitting on my boat, smoking a cigar, kind of bitching about how much a CEO entrepreneur life can be sometimes. And that there is, there is some dark sides and there is some, there is some shit to this side, this, that, that role as well as, as the good side. Um, so that one has almost a million views. The other two, one was just me complaining about Forbes magazine and then putting 
people on the cover as uh, iconic role models that end up going to prison. So Elizabeth Holmes, uh, he's she's on there. Uh, we got SBF uh, going the whole cryptocurrency Bitcoin fraud thing. That one had a hundred thousand. And then the other one was we had an employee. Literally, it was like three sentences. My whole post it has about a hundred thousand views. Um, it was just, hey, I had a work from home employee that was actually working two full time jobs. <laughs> and this is why it sucks. Uh, so the what what I've learned is people just want to know the good. They want to know the bad. They want to know the story behind the story. What's going on behind the scenes? Those are things that people really care about. Uh, my LinkedIn has done about 7.5 million views uh, of my post uh, since we started tracking it. Um, and really a third of those have come in the last 12 months. So what, what happens on, on LinkedIn is it just takes some time for those views to kind of go and you get that cusp, that base going up. It's like I have a snowball rolling down. But LinkedIn's mine. I'm not saying you need to use LinkedIn. Um, I'm saying I just had this conversation today with someone like pick one. I don't care if it's TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, the truth, LinkedIn, I don't care. Just pick one where your people are, your customers are, and figure out how it works and provide valuable content and be helpful. So all that's about content creation, but you need to leverage the content creation. And that comes down to SEO. Um, so I'm not gonna sit here and give you a speech on SEO, but I'm just gonna give you kind of the, the primer. Uh, there's on-page SEO and there's off-page SEO. On-page SEO is super easy. That is just making sure you got the right size pictures, your load speed, the images are titled right, there's your keywords are in your headers, there's the right keyword mentioned so many times in the body of the text, it's at a you know, seventh grade readability level. Like there, there's a whole bunch of things, there's tools you can use on the internet to, to optimize pages. That part, it's not much of a learning curve. Um, anyone that's been around for a while can definitely optimize pages and, and make, them, make them work for you. The, the more difficult one where people usually falter is actually the one that's way more important and that's off-page SEO. So what off-page means is you can build the most beautiful content on anything you want, right? But nobody will find it if nobody links to your page because Google will think you're irrelevant. So the more pages that link to you, the more Google understands like, yep, you are somebody important because people keep linking to you. So link building was probably the number one thing I did way back in the early days for SEO. I didn't focus on on-page much. I focused on getting link backs from my customers on their web pages. I got link backs from our vendors on their pages. Uh, we were members of different organizations. We were members of uh, trade organizations. We were members of local channels of commerce, make sure I'm on there. It was just working with anybody and everybody to give me that link back to my site because I didn't care about the actual traffic from it. I cared about making sure Google knew people were linking to me and I was relevant. And there's a whole bunch of different ways uh, you can do that. But if you want to increase your page rank, focus on both those. I would focus more time on off page than I would on page. Just get the basics of on page done. It doesn't need to be perfect. Uh, but again, drives tremendous amount of traffic. Uh, a couple of years ago, paid search was the number one way we got traffic. I can tell the audience today, organic traffic is by far the most popular way we get traffic. And by the way, it converts a lot better than paid traffic. So, so that's kind of how to build an authority, right? Provide value, provide information, position yourself as the expert, don't be salesy. Just know that they will call you or they'll reach out to you when they need help. I get people every single day hitting me up on one of the platforms, just saying, I need to talk to you guys, let's do a thing together, strategic partner, new vendor, could be a lot of new customers. Like there, it, it will happen, it just takes time. So. This is a busy slide, but I'll, I'll explain it for the audio portion here. Um, and this has to do with like value, right? So I knew I couldn't go sell the same thing everybody else sells. Um, I was selling my own stuff and I didn't have much, but I was also selling other people's diagnostic tools, but surrounding it with repair information and technical support. And what I learned is I gotta create, I gotta create more value. Because if I create more value, I create a differentiator in the marketplace and you can command a premium price. So I can say that the tools we sell, like we sell some, we sell, resell Kajali and Texa. Those are two of our, our most respected brands we sell. Um, and even Nexic, we, we charge more for that product by 20 or 30% than everybody else. And 
it's because of all the value that we provide that customers understand and see that value and don't mind paying for. So I'll walk you through how we did this. When, when I first did this, it was just the diagnostic tool. You hooked the tool up, it would tell you the codes, all the things. What happened was is next, I said, well, now customers need repair information for the fault codes. So I, I went and told people that, hey, I'm gonna go build a software program that tells people how to fix every fault code that's ever existed for any commercial truck. And they looked at me like I was kind of half crazy or insane to do that, but we built it um, and we included it for free because now I have something nobody else does and I can charge a higher price. I can give you a diagnostic tool and repair information. The other piece that we added quickly after was diesel tech support. So although customers had the tool and repair information, they needed to talk to an expert to just figure out, hey, what's going on? What do you think? Who can I talk to? So now we have over 50 people in our call center doing tech support. And then kind of the last big piece was training. And originally I thought it was just software training, but what I quickly realized is, again, this goes back to, and it shouldn't surprise me, people need solutions. They don't need products. And the solution that they needed was to fix their equipment more efficiently. And part of that, a big part of it, is training the diesel techs that are out there, existing ones, how to be, how to more properly diagnose something more effectively than throwing the parts cannon at it. So that's been our evolution. But I, I think as you look at other products, your product, other ones you've seen, you'll see other companies do a similar thing. Just provide value, provide value, create differentiators, and then you can't be competed against because nobody offers what you offer. Um, and those customers that are beating you up on price want the cheapest thing, probably not the customers most people want. Uh, I know it's not the ones that I want. The other big piece that I alluded to earlier was being debt free. So when I moved to South Carolina, uh, 15 years ago now, 20 years, whatever it's been, uh, I can tell everyone that um, my financial life, personal life was a disaster. Literally took two credit cards to get through the, get through the uh, grocery store. I had thousands, tens of thousands of dollars of debt my, my wife knew nothing about. I owed money on my cars, student loans. Like I was probably like a lot of people. Um, but it was, it was at that moment where, and this is well before I even started diesel laptops, was I got to get out of this hole. It's, it's holding us back. Um, so we got, we got debt free um, personally. Um, and I always said, I'm going to run the business the same way. So we run the business debt free today um, because, you know, and I, I, I get grief from people a lot of time on, on two fronts. One, man, how much faster could you grow your company if you took on some debt and had some leverage? Well, at the start of it, we talked about it. We've already, we've already done pretty well for ourselves growing our company. That hasn't been our problem. Um, and then two, I always say, look, I have yet to see a debt free company go bankrupt. Um, every time you see one go bankrupt, they're leveraged to the hilt based on a lot of smart people making a lot of smart decisions at the time. And I do smart in air quotes there because people don't take risk into, into, into account quite often when they're doing math uh, on things. And inevitably, when things do go bad, as we saw in 08, uh, we saw with COVID, even with some inflation stuff going on now with some banks failing, it's never one thing that causes you to go under. You can be really smart up until a point. Uh, but it's usually a combination of a couple things out of your control usually that all collide at once and all of a sudden things don't go so well. So, so through all that, as I was growing the company, um, it's what I've been talking about here is people didn't want my product. They wanted a solution to their problem and they wanted to buy from people they trust. So the, the, the real truth of the matter here is, is I can go sell or give a $10,000 professional tool to anyone, right? I can give someone to my mom and doesn't mean she can actually fix a truck any more efficiently than the day before because she's missing the other pieces of the, of, the, of the puzzle. She's missing the training. She's missing the knowledge. She's missing the ability to talk to peers. And that's really what I was starting to figure out here at Diesel Laptops. And customers, they were investing in me um, they didn't really seem to care too much about the product. They didn't have problems buying product names they never heard of. I didn't have to convince them like this is a good product. It was just like, here's the solution. Here's what it does. Um, it was actually amazing how many customers didn't even care to see what it looked like. They just wanted to make sure it worked. Um, and I, I focused there and I, I focused on, again, creating more value and providing better support. So I knew if I do those things, I knew, I knew I could support my customers way better than these uh, Fortune 500 companies that were out there trying to do it with call centers based in other countries. 
And it ended up at Diesel Laptops going from one product, which was the laptop kit, to starting to create distinctive visions of our company. So today we really have four distinctive visions. We have Diesel Laptops, which is actually selling the hardware. We have Diesel Repair, uh, which has all of our repair information content. We have Diesel Training, which Diesel Training is what's training all the diesel technicians out there. And then the last one is our support division. So we have the ability to remotely support our customers. And through that, we found now we have new revenue streams because now I don't need to sell the entire kit. I can sell just pieces. I can sell you just hardware, just training, or just repair information, or just diesel tech experience to, to help you troubleshoot. So it's allowed us to go there. So what, what's changed, I guess, in the years with, with diesel laptops is we, we've figured out that there's basically different tiers of tools. You got your lower tier, mid tier, and upper tier. And as you go up the tier, you expect more functionality, but the price goes up more. And the higher you go up the tier, the, the smaller your customer base is. So for example, on the bottom, we have like our diesel decoder, a little $350 tool, turns your phone to a diagnostic tool, reads and clears codes and does regens. I can sell that to everybody that owns a truck, um, everyone that's a diesel tech, there's hundreds of thousands of customers for that tool. Uh, on the upper end is our $10,000 tools. Well, not a lot of people need 99.9% .9 dealership level functionality across all makes all models. Um, but we have that product and then you have ones in the middle. So where we've changed diesel laptops to now is really, and we've always, we're doing this, we just never had all the right options. It's, it's right fitting the customer for the right tools uh, for each unique experience that they have. So it's, it's good conversations we have with customers and it's about right fitting them. It's not about selling the most possible expensive tool to the customer or the other mistake all our competitors make is they have one product and no matter who they talk to, they jam it in there saying it fits. And that is totally not the truth at all when it comes to diagnostic tools. Diesel Repair is our, SaaS, our B2B SaaS platform. So this is where customers go to get fault code information, uh, look up TSBs, recalls, component locators, remove and replace instructions, VIN, di VIN wiring, e wiring diagrams, symptom-based troubleshooting, just, just anything, anything you need to be able to fix the truck in terms of information or knowledge is what we built Diesel Repair into and we spent millions of dollars building that platform out. The other one that's being consolidated into it is called Diesel Parts. So Diesel Parts is essentially what we realized is all the tools and all the repair information led customers to the part they need to buy. And let's go facilitate and make that easy for them to find out the part number that they wanna buy. So that's what Diesel Parts is, and it's a way for people to look up parts through cross-reference, exploded views, VIN to filter, uh, we got attribute data for parts, kind of like a, a central warehouse of all things knowledge uh, about data on truck parts is what Diesel Parts is. And then our training centers. So we, we own some of our own training centers, and then we also have training centers where it's not our teacher, it's not our building, but it's our curriculum. So the training centers that Diesel Laptops owns are in Dallas, Chicago, Atlanta, and here in Columbia, South Carolina. Uh, there's some big aspirations in the coming years to expand this out to more and more cities. Uh, and as time goes on, I'm, I'm sure we'll keep, we'll keep on doing that. Um, and one of the things we've really pivoted to here lately is we used to charge customers per class. Now, if you're in support, with us, which means you're within the first year or buy a support package for our premier kits, you now get unlimited classroom training um, anywhere we have training centers. Um, so that's after treatment, electrical, CAN bus, hydraulics, uh, oscilloscopes, HVAC systems. It's about 5% software, about 95% how to actually fix something. Uh, we do online webinars where we also do live ones um, and pre-recorded where we do them in big group sessions. And then we have on-demand courses. I can tell the audience here as well that we have a new version coming out in June or July-ish. Uh, this will be the world's largest site for diesel technician training. And most of it will be 100% free. So this will be a great platform for anybody anywhere that wants to learn uh, about diesel diagnostics, diesel repair, troubleshooting, all the things that come along. And our biggest seller is actually field training now, where our technicians actually show up on site for these uh, larger companies. And uh, we got training, at the end of the day, it's a lot of training. There's training going on somewhere in the United States every single day of the month. Uh, 
that is happening. So feel free to head to training.diesellaptops.com if you want to learn more about that. And then tech support. So uh, alluded to a little bit earlier as well, we now have over 50 people in a call center. And in that call center, half of them are diesel techs. And they customers can chat with us, they can call us. And our guys are helping them nonstop all day long. There's over 400 customer, 400 cases a day that we're doing. Um, it ranges everything from OEM to aftermarket, on highway, marine, power sports, heavy truck, any of the equipment we're selling uh, happens in there. And that's that's really it. I just, hopefully, hopefully you guys all got a little something out of this out of this podcast, I know it's a little a little different than the normal, um, but there's some takeaways I want you to take, and I, I got them up on the screen. But for the for everyone else, just because something bad happens doesn't mean your life is over. And I'm telling you, a lot of times, just look within, evaluate the situation. You will find that those things that happened to you turned out actually to be blessings in disguise. Uh, provide value to your customers. If you can provide value more than your competitors, you can charge a premium price, you can differentiate yourself from the marketplace, and customers will pay for it. I know a lot of you aren't gonna do it, but debt free, it works, it's worked for me. Uh, listen to some Dave Ramsey if you're unsure, check out his books, Total Money Makeover, go on his podcast. Uh, a lot of positive reasons to be, to be debt free, and being debt free doesn't mean it holds your life back from anything. In fact, it really liberates you uh, more than anything else. Uh, no matter how big your competitor is, it doesn't matter how big, how established, how long they've been around for, there is always an advantage you can find. You just gotta find it. Talk to enough customers, look at enough other industries, I promise you there is always an advantage that they will have over you. And the last one is just build trust. You build trust through consistency, through honesty, through being helpful, being knowledgeable, being transparent. These are all things that customers really come to appreciate at the end of the day. So with that one, we're gonna call it a wrap on this episode. I appreciate if you made it this far for watching, for listening. Take care out there. I know the next entrepreneur out there that I'm gonna be following is hopefully listening to this podcast. I'm always available to be reached if you need help with anything. Thank you for watching and listening. Like, share, subscribe. We appreciate it all, and we'll catch you on the next episode.